These medium one pound bowls are probably one of the pieces that I've made the most over the past 10 years or so. And while the dimensions they're thrown to stay roughly the same, over the years there have been subtle changes to the shape, be it how the foot rings trimmed or perhaps how the lip is finished. Either way, with every newly thrown batch, every new iteration, there are some subtle little things that change as I make these. The first part of the process, of course, is the centering on the wheel. This is when the clay is coned up and down and pushed to be as central on the wheel head as possible. And believe me, that's easier said than done. As any potter will know, centering can be a pain to learn, but like riding a bike, when you figured it out, when that thing in your mind has clicked, it's almost impossible to forget. Once the clay is centered, I carefully draw up the walls, pinching them between my knuckle on the outside and the pads of my fingers on the inside. And for these kinds of bowls, initially I pull them into this sort of shape, which are thickly walled and with a thick rim, as during the next step, as I stretch these walls out, everything becomes thinner. So if you begin with a thin cylinder and thin rim, as you stretch the clay out, there's a good chance it can rip and tear. You can easily see on the left hand side of the bowl my throwing gauge's pointer, which is meeting the rim. This is measured and set beforehand, and I like having this physical point that I can aim towards as I'm throwing, and it's by using this throwing gauge, together with weighed out lumps of clay, that I can get all my bowls to be more or less exactly the same. I then sponge out the water from the inside, and then I use a sharp metal kidney to scrape away the excess slip. I'm not aiming for a perfectly smooth surface, as I like the marks left by the tools, and ultimately the glazes I use will cover much of these anyway, so working to get the interior walls perfectly smooth and round would almost be a waste of time in this instance. Finally, once the rim's been smoothed off, I drag a taut wire underneath the bowl, before quickly cleaning the worst of the slip off my hands by scraping it on the edge of a sharp metal bucket, and then I lift the bowl up by digging my fingers into the excess clay left in the base purposefully and set it aside with the others. These are relatively quick forms to make, and I always try to use clay that's slightly on the softer side just to make the centering process much more seamless. After all, these aren't very complicated shapes, and as long as you don't overthrow the clay, which might weaken it, you can actually get away by using clay that's really very soft. Once the clay has been coned up and down a number of times, which is sort of just like wedging but on the wheel, I take a moment to compress it with my fist just to make sure that it's perfectly centered before putting down my throwing gauge's pointer and then carefully making a hole in the center of the ball of clay. I purposefully leave about a centimeter to about a centimeter and a half in the base of these. This provides ample material to trim a nice tall foot ring from, together with supporting the overhanging walls and giving you material that you can press into to lift the pot away from once it's thrown. Initially, I always throw the clay to be slightly taller than my throwing gauge's pointer, and then as I ease the clay out, as it stretches the clay, the form will get lower and lower. Once the rim meets the rubber pointer, I spend a moment just compressing and pinching the rim to get it to my desired thickness. I then remove the excess water from inside the bowl, and then, before I do any shaping, I scrape away a little bit of the excess clay from the base here. I always do this before shaping the interior form, as pushing the tool in underneath can cause a slight bump to raise in the interior form. So by removing the clay on the outside first, it means that I only need to shape the inside once, as opposed to twice if you do it the other way round. Of course, it's worth noting that this might only literally apply to my way of throwing bowls. There are dozens of ways of doing things when you're making pottery, and while these videos may act as helpful guides sometimes, you'll find that there will be some things that work for you and some things that don't. And ultimately, these videos are a look into my practice and the way I do things, rather than being general tutorials. I think it's also worth mentioning that many of the videos that I will be posting will show many of the same processes. After all, I think fundamentally I am a production potter and I spend a lot of time making the same forms over and over again. So really, like my Instagram, I want the videos on YouTube to sort of just follow my practice as it goes. If I happen to be making bowls or mugs that week, then there might be another video about bowls or mugs. I don't think I can constantly be coming up with new ideas and brand new forms every single week, and I hope you don't mind that. Anyhow, the following day, 
Once the bowls are properly leather hard and ready to trim, I can move on to the next stage. The plastic here is simply there to keep the bowls from drying out too much, which, as the kilns have been on so much recently, means this studio is really warm. Before trimming can begin, I set my calipers to the desired 6cm measurement. This marks the exterior boundary for my foot ring, and once the bowl has been properly tap centred and secured down with three soft lumps of clay, I'll mark out a 6cm circle by using a pair of calipers and a sharp potter's needle to score in a line. One mark is enough, I don't bother with another interior mark to show how wide the interior footwell will be, as really I can just do that by eye. And finally, I can begin to remove excess clay from the outside. And you'll notice two things here. First, the position at which I'm holding the trimming tool from, which is as close to the end as possible, which is highly advantageous as compared to if you were holding the tool at the other end. This way there's minimal kickback from the bowl if anything were to catch. And I also have a lot more control. And it also allows me to really dig the tool into the clay, to remove a lot of mass in very few movements. Whereas again, if you were to be using the tool by only grasping the end of the handle, you'd barely be able to use any pressure at all to dig into the clay. And also, any slight wobble or undulation in the walls will just be exaggerated, as your trimming tool will likely just follow those contours, when in actuality, you really want to push through any bump that arises. Any slight wobble or undulation, if you hold your tools strongly enough, you'll be able to trim right through them. For anybody who's watching who thinks that I might be removing too much clay, it's worth noting just how thin these bowls are. Moreover, the excess clay in the base means that I can turn nice tall foot rings, and the extra clay also means I can lift them off from the wheel very easily without having to use any throwing bats, which helps to speed up production even if it means there's a few extra seconds spent trimming. Once the outside walls have been trimmed, I can begin to remove mass from the inside of the footwell. This is perhaps a trickier process than removing clay from the outside, as your movements really need to be very controlled, as not only can you trim a hole in the bottom, but you can also go too far either side, and thus creating a foot that is perhaps too thin for the size of the pot. To check the thickness in the base I do one of two things. I either push down very slightly with my thumb, just to see if there's any movement, or if I'm being a little more cautious, I'll tap the base and hear the resonance that it makes, and that's a good indicator of just how thick it is. A low pitched thud means that it's probably a little bit thick, and a higher pitched noise usually means that it's thin. Of course, this noise can change depending on the form you're making, which can make it quite a tricky technique to learn, and one to use effectively. Lastly, I take my maker's mark and I push it into the soft leather hard clay. Of course, this displaces the clay somewhat, so afterwards I just do a small amount of cleanup on the top, and then burnish the clay with just my fingertips. And that's it, more or less. I carefully lift the piece away and set it to dry out with the others. As these pieces are so thin, they dry out incredibly fast. So as they're turning from leather hard to bone dry, I try to position them somewhere where they'll dry evenly. So no drafts or patches of sunlight, as if they dry out too quickly on one side. This can cause them to warp a little bit. When I push this clay down to secure the bowl in place, I don't push the clay into the bowl itself, rather I push it downward and I let the excess that squashes against the bowl be the clay that supports it. Otherwise you can quite easily deform the rim of the piece if you push the supporting clay directly into the rim of the bowl. This is by far, I think, my favourite part of making pottery. The long ribbons of clay that fly away from the bowl and the satisfaction that comes with making incredibly light and delicate pieces. I think I'm a potter who prefers the trimming process as compared to the throwing process. And I think beyond just finding the process to be more satisfying, I'm not really a fan of the mess that comes with throwing. It's more just one of those annoying byproducts of the process that I wish I could do without. At least with this process, the turning, all the trimmings are dry and very easy to dispose of. Although dispose is the wrong word really, I do recycle all of these trimmings from this process. Even as I trim here, my left hand is still applying downward pressure onto the bowl to stop it from potentially leaping up as I work. And even when I can't find a place for it on the very top of the bowl, it'll rest on the side and apply very slight inward pressure from above. And even as I'm working here, you'll notice whenever I'm trimming, I'm connecting my two hands. Often I connect my thumbs and my fingertips 
or even my wrist sometimes. It doesn't really matter which parts, and these days I no longer think about it as I'm working. It's just subconscious, but this connection is really important as it builds stability in your movements, as opposed to just holding one tool freely and connecting both my arms and leaning my body weight onto the tools as well to make it as stable and secure as possible. This isn't to say that you can't work freely and loose. You certainly can, if that's the look you're going for, but it's still always best to do it with this same level of control. As when trimming, all it takes is one moment, one wrong movement to ruin the entire piece. I don't know how many of these I've made at this point. It must be thousands. And yet, they continue to be the piece that I'm always looking forward to making. Occasionally as I'm trimming, the interior form will develop a slight bevel from where I've been pushing on the underside of the bowl. So to correct that, I just use a sharp metal kidney to push it slightly back into place. This won't work if it's especially bad, but if it's only little, it's very easy to fix. All these very thin trimmings are then dumped straight into my reclaim bucket, and here they'll quickly disintegrate, and eventually it can be worked back into usable clay. I'll be going over the following steps relatively quickly this week. So the next step, once the bowls are completely bone dry, they're packed into my electric kiln for a bisque firing, which takes them up to a thousand degrees centigrade overnight. This changes the clay into a ceramic, and the ceramic is absorbent and much stronger too, so I don't have to be as careful when I'm handling it and moving it around the studio. Once the pots have been bisque fired, it's time to wax their feet. This essentially just creates a wax resist on the areas that I don't want to draw in any glaze when they're dunked into it. And the wax itself is just the wax emulsion that most pottery supplies will sell. I just water mine down with some boiling water and give it a good mix, which makes it brush on a bit more easily. This is one of those skills where tap centering makes your life a whole lot easier. The wax is simply brushed on, and I'm very careful as I do this, making sure that the brush doesn't snag on the very absorbent clay which would draw it off centre. Lastly I dab some extra wax into my maker's mark, just to make sure that it's totally covered. Then these waxed pots can all be set aside until I'm ready to do some glazing which is something that I've just been spending the last month or so in the studio doing. The glazing is simple too, really. I grasp the bowl with a pair of tongs and then dunk it into my bucket of glaze. This is a feldspatic based crackle glaze, coloured red here simply with some red iron oxide, which eventually will bring out the green colours when the pots are reduction fired in the gas kiln. My previous video to this goes into that process in a lot more detail, if you're interested. The bowls are then all set aside, and a few days later I can begin the cleanup procedure. This is when I clean over the tong marks, which I've just done there. I then remove any pinholes or more prominent drip marks, working always over a basin of water, which I dump the glazed dust directly into, as this stuff isn't the best to breathe in. I take my time with this, as really, the cleaner they look at this stage, the better they'll look once reduction fired. All the excess glaze that's removed during this process is collected and eventually I'll sieve it back into my larger buckets of glaze, such as the one the bowl was initially dunked into. I then carefully do the same to the inside of the foot ring, and then I take a damp sponge and I carefully sponge away the excess glaze that settled onto the waxed foot. And really I'm just trying to make the line between glaze and clay be as pristine and straight as possible. And then the same thing is done to the inside of the foot well, which is very tricky to get perfectly right. And to do this I sort of rotate the bowl and move the sponge in the same motion. And it's this process that really eats up time, as generally I'm probably doing this to about four to five hundred pieces, and it probably takes about two to three minutes per piece. But again, I think it's worth it, as it makes all the difference in the end. All the pots are then placed into my gas kiln, which is then reduction fired up to about 1,285 degrees centigrade over a nine hour period. And then a day or so later, they can all be unpacked. Still hot to the touch though, hence the gloves. And luckily, there have been some really lovely pieces to come out of the last five firings. <laughs> 
a result I think of glazing them much thicker, which works for the bowls, but not so much other forms sometimes. The final step is just to sand the bases very quickly, which I do with some fine wet and dry sandpaper submerged under a thin layer of water. I'm not trying to make the clay on the foot ring perfectly smooth, I'm just trying to remove any sharp pieces of grit that might be there. And that's more or less it, finally. The final step will be to photograph the pieces, and then update my online shop, which should hopefully happen within the coming weeks. Anyway, I'll leave you this week with just a few close-ups of some of the bolts. Many of these darker green ones fired especially well, but I think there's still so much I need to learn in regard to glaze application. Thanks for watching as always, and I'll see you next week.